Lord, we come to you this morning and we would say, please, Lord, speak, Lord, in the stillness while we wait on thee. Hush our hearts to listen in expectancy. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, if you follow along here in uh, Genesis chapter 6, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, verse 9, Genesis 6, 9, these are the generations of Noah, Noah was a just, a man of integrity, fidelity, just man, and perfect, as we saw before, wholehearted, sincere, in his generations. And Noah walked with God, verse 10. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, verse 11. The earth also was corrupt, or sinking down, before God, or literally uh, before God's face. And the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come, or it's coming up, or unrolling like a scroll, before me, it's again, to my face. For the earth is filled with violence through them, literally, before their face. <clears throat> so you look at verse 13 there, violence was before the face of men, you compare that with verse 11, the corruption was before the face of God. Verse, uh, continuing, verse 13. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, <clears throat> rooms or nests, shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch, and this is the fashion that thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window or a skylight shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shall... Thou set in the side thereof with the lower, second, and third story, shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood, or an overflowing, of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee, and of thy every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive. With thee they shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, of cattle after their kind, of creeping things of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And thou and take thou unto thee all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee. And it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. Now, as we saw last week, Genesis 6 is the time before the flood. And it's it was a time of great busyness. Everyone was very busy. And so in our last study, what we, what, we wanted, what we tried to look at is what were they busy with? And three particular questions. And if we understand what the world and God and Noah were busy with before the flood, then from what the world was doing before the flood, we'll understand what the world is doing today. And from what God was doing before the flood, we'll understand what God is doing today. And from what Noah was doing before the flood, we'll understand what God wants us to do today. Now, what was the world busy doing before the flood? It was a very busy world before the flood. And so, who, who, anybody remember? What was the world doing before the flood? Well, okay, they were. <laughs> they were marrying, giving in marriage. We didn't cover that, but that's true, right? Yes? All right, that was big time sitting. Now, look at verse 11. See, the earth also was corrupt in the face of God, and the earth was filled with violence. So number one, the earth was, the world or the earth was busy at work, depressing, that's what the literal meaning of the word is, themselves down into a state of moral corruption, immorality towards God, and violence, or Hamas, that's what the word is, or violence toward men, or in the face of men. So they were being disobedient to the two great commandments that the Lord Jesus Christ stated in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39, which is, number one, to love the Lord with all your heart, so that's don't be corrupt, and number two, to love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, don't be violent toward him. Now, number, then you look at, at verse 12, Genesis 6, 12, and it said, all flesh had 
corrupted his way upon the earth. So this is the world was busy corrupting their way on the earth, corrupting their way. The, way, the word way here is interesting, it's the word derech, and what it is, it's a Hebrew word for road, but it has as its base meaning a compacting down or a treading down like you find in a road. So it means to be like a, a, a tr trodden down path or a road that has that um, been compacted. So in other words, it's a road which is routinely walked on. That's the meaning of this word, routinely walked on. Therefore, the ground is beaten down, it's compacted down. And people walked on that road, and they never gave it a second thought. They just walked by habit. They just walked on the road. That's the meaning. That's the root meaning of that word, direct. And so uh, you ever do what I do sometimes? You know, you, you have to go someplace, like, you know, i got to go to a store and La Mesa, for example, and without even thinking, I get on the freeway and I'm heading to work. <laughs> and I realize, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm not going where I should be going, right? Well, why did I do that? Because I just got on the direct. I just got on the road of habit. That's the base meaning, the road that's commonly traveled. That's a picture here of what this word way means when it says they corrupted their way. It means, that, it means that when all flesh had corrupted their way, it means that moral corruption had become so natural, so routine, so much a habit, that it was just, the, just what they did without even thinking about it. That's the way they lived, and they just didn't give it a second thought. The manner of their lives or their daily habits was moral corruption, was, was morally corrupt. You know, twice something happened to me last Friday. It was interesting. First, I get a phone call in the morning, and this man named Archie, and, you know, oh, hi, how are you? I said, well, who are you? <laughs> how are you? Who are you? <laughs> I'm Archie. Okay, why are you calling? Well, he is a handyman, wants to do some work around the house. Okay. So we're talking, and in the course of the conversation, he says, oh, Jesus, like that. And, you know, that's a special name. So I said, I said to him, what did you just say? And he said, nothing. And I said, no, no, he wasn't even aware of it. And so uh, why was he not aware of it? Because it was a habit with him. It was a direct with him. It was a routinely trodden down road. It was a road that he just, he just said that name by habit. I told him, I said, you just said Jesus. I said, I said friend, you don't want to use that name like that. You very much need that name to save you, and you don't want to be throwing that name in the dirt. So then later on at night, Cheryl and I went out to a restaurant, and some guy sees some friends across the, the, the um, restaurant, and he yells out, Jesus Christ, how the hell are you? I mean, I don't even like to say it, you know. <laughs> he says this. I was like, you know, I'm shocked. I look on his face. I look on the face of, the, of his friends, no one seemed shocked. No one seemed ashamed. And how can people do that? How can people take that name? That's the only name that God has given to us to be saved. How can they treat that name with less respect than they treat the name of their dog? How can they do that? Well, because, verse 12, all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. They've made that corruption just a habit in their lives, and they don't even think about it. They've corrupted their direct, they corrupted their natural habits on the earth. So number one, the world was very busy making moral corruptions their direct, their habits of life, and they made themselves unaware of what they were actually doing, and they were also uh, brutally violent toward their fellow man. Now, you quoted a verse in Matthew 24, Irene, where we're talking about they were marrying and giving in marriage, and the context of that verse was that was was the Matthew 24, 39, where it says, and they knew not until the flood came. So, number two, the world was busy making themselves the new not generation by creating their own reality. They were creating their own reality. Second Peter 3, 5 talks about this they were willingly are ignorant of. So number two, the world was busy making themselves willfully ignorant. And what was, okay, so those are the two things the Lord, the, that the world was doing. Now, next, 
what was the Lord doing? What was the Lord busy doing before the flood? The Lord was very busy. And what was God busy doing before the flood? Okay, I'm going to take a, take a stab at that. Anybody like to say it again? Okay, very good. He was looking about the earth. Now this we get in, in Genesis 6-3 where it says, Every imagination of the thoughts of the heart of his heart was only evil continually. Now I'm going to ask you another question. From that verse, this is an obvious question, don't look for anything deep. From that verse, what part of man does God look at the most? The heart, right. That's the boiling pot inside of us. That's the boiling part from which our actions spring out. Our thoughts, it's our thoughts, it's our mind that's the boiling pot inside of us from which our actions come out. And God is more interested in the boiling pot than what comes out. Because he knows what's going to come out, but the boiling, part's where it all, boiling pot is where it all starts. Okay? And I'll think about this, and I think about this, my uncle Stanford Absaloff. Yeah, that's my uncle's name. That was my mother's name, Absaloff. My uncle Stanford Absaloff and his wife were both professors at, of English literature at Kent State University in Kent, Ohio. And his wife, Marilyn, she has had multiple sclerosis for over 50 years. She has a special van for her wheelchair, and, and she goes to the Kent State gym, and she swims. She's a terrific swimmer. She was raised in Cape Cod, and, and, and she used to do all the review of the children's literature in World Book Encyclopedia. So if you ever get a, one of the yearbooks for a World Book Encyclopedia and you go to New England children's literature, you'll see that they were reviewed by uh, Professor Marilyn Absloff. That's the wife of my uncle. But with the MS that she has, she can't cook. She just can't cook. So Uncle Stanford does all the cooking. And Uncle Stanford always had one method of cooking, and he calls it his one-pot method. He doesn't like to cook, see? He calls it his one-pot method. So and whatever is going to be served for a meal goes into the one pot that's cooking on the stove, and that'll end up on the table. That's the way it is at Uncle Stanford's house. And Uncle Stanford has hanging above his stove a large wok pan and a, and a lid, and he goes and he'll buy chicken or meat and cut it in and throw it into the pot. Then he goes and gets a can of stewed tomatoes or a can of beans or corn. It all gets mixed together in the pot. And, and Uncle Stanford's quite proud of this method. He thinks everybody else wastes a lot of time, you know, <laughs> as well as, you know, makes a lot of dishes dirty because he just uses this one pot, see? So when I'm hungry over at Uncle Stanford's house and I ask him what's for dinner, he says, Lift the lid, look in the pot, see for yourself. See? <laughs> That's because what's in the pot is going to be on the table. And so, you know, <laughs> you know, when God wants to see what we are and what we're going to end up doing, he goes over himself and lifts the pot and lifts the lid and looks in the pot of our minds. That's what he does. And he sees who we are. And so when it says in verse 5 that God saw every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, what was God busy doing before the flood? He was busy lifting lids and looking at pots. He was looking in the minds, the mind pots, and he was evaluating the thoughts and the imaginations of man. That's what God is busy doing now. God is lifting the lids of the pots of our minds, and he's seeing what's cooking in there. And he's looking into each one of us. He sees better than MRI. He sees better than a CAT scan. He sees right into the deep parts of our hearts and he evaluates and he's asking the question, what are we thinking about? What are you thinking about? What am I thinking about right now? That's God doing that. What are you imagining? What are we imagining? God's looking at that. What are we purposing to do? That's God's looking at that. What are our intentions? What do we love? What do we delight in? What do we hate? That's what all that God is doing is he lifts up the lid and looks inside. Now, why does God do that? Does God really do that? He does. Why does he do that? He lifts it because he said in Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart proceed, and that Greek word means rises like aromas, proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. 
So he lifts the lid on the pot of our minds because he realizes, as he said in 1 John 3, 15, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. It doesn't say whosoever hateth his brother will be a murderer. It says whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So just like at Uncle Stanford's when I wanted to find out what's for dinner, I went over and lifted the pot. When God wants to find out who we are and what we'll do, he lifts the pot on our minds. And he lifts the pot because he cares, because he loves, because he created us, because he owns us. Every single person he owns. And so he lifts the lot, and he lifts it up, and he looks inside, and he wants to see what did we choose to put in that pot? Just like Uncle Stanford, he goes and chooses, makes a choice, puts it in there. And God has provided good things for us to put in the pot. He's provided us his word, the word of God, good things in the word of God. He wants us to put that in the pot of our minds. But that's just like if Uncle Stanford makes the choice what he's going to put in the pot. It's our choice what we're going to put in the pot. We make the decision. He wants us to choose the right things, but we make the decision. So... Because he knows that if we put the good things of his word in, in, in the pot of our minds, then out will come the fruit of the Spirit. That'll be a good thing. So now it says, as you see here in Genesis 6, 8, And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 5, God saw. Verse 12, God looked. And so we see here, as we put this all together, God was, was looking very hard. He was looking very hard for anyone who would repent and turn to him. And he keeps looking every day. And anyone turning from his sin today, and he's looking. And tomorrow, or maybe tomorrow, tomorrow's another day. Maybe I'll find it that day. I'll go around, lift up the, the lids again. And, and, and he's looking every single day. Now, what a contrast this is when you consider Genesis 131, where you remember it says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So that's Genesis 131. That's the last verse in Genesis 1. It says, God saw everything that he had made, behold, it was very good. Think of that verse, Genesis 131, with the verse in front of us, Genesis 6, 12, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. In the Hebrew, there's no difference in the way those two verses start. Uh, saw and looked are the same word. It's exactly the same words. They both start off with Vayar Elohim et. So in other words, God looked, but what he found was drastically different. Verse 31 of, he, of Genesis 1, Behold, it was very good. Verse 12 of Genesis 6, Behold, it was corrupt. So God was busy looking very hard, as you mentioned, Diana. Busy evaluating the thoughts and imaginations of the hearts of men before the flood. Now, next thing we see in verse 3, his day shall be 120 years. His day shall be 120 years. We remember from 2 Peter 3.20, it said, The long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was, a prayer, was preparing. Long suffering waited. His days shall be 120 years. That's what it describes. The commentary for Genesis 6.3, that his day shall be 120 years, is 2 Peter 3.20, when it says that during that time, that was the long suffering of God waiting. I didn't know, I bet you didn't know you could be busy waiting. You can. Sometimes it's very hard to wait. I don't like to wait. It takes a lot of energy. Anyway, and then it says in Romans 2, 4, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Isaiah 28, 21 says, talks about the judgment on Israel. He says, for the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth, that means angry, wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act, and that's judgment. So God calls judgment his strange work. God calls judgment his strange act. Why? He doesn't want to do it. God does not want to judge man. God never wanted to bring the flood judge, judgment on the earth, but man pushed him into it. Man pushed God. Man pushed God too far. So before the flood, the second thing we see God doing is busy making a space of time for man to repent. 
busy being long-suffering, busy waiting, busy trying to lead men, to lead sinners to repentance. And then we see in verse 13, the third thing that God was doing, God said unto Noah, it said there, so it goes on, a, long, a lot of verses what he said to Noah. But that's where it starts, in Genesis 6, 13. God said to Noah. So God was busy talking to Noah. He was talking to Noah about what? He was talking to Noah about judgment that was coming. He was talking to Noah about why judgment was coming. He was talking to Noah about building the ark of salvation. He was talking to Noah about, he was making him a promise to save him and anybody who went with him, his family and anyone who would come into the ark. So, we see, <clears throat> this is what God was doing, summary. Number one, he was busy looking into men's hearts and their imaginations and their thoughts for any repentance. Number two, he was busy creating a space to repent. He was busy waiting. He was busy long-suffering, waiting for man to repent because he didn't want to judge the earth. And number three, he was busy talking to Noah to prepare for salvation from judgment and preach to others so that they can be saved. And that's what he's telling Noah. Now, last, what was Noah doing, busy doing during the flood? Well, okay, does someone like to say something? What was Noah doing before the flood? Oh, he was building an ark. That took up a lot of his time. <laughs> it was a big ark. <laughs> that was a big ark. Figured it out. It was, had a, what, say it again? It was walking with God. Yeah, okay, good. I was just thinking about the ark. You guys are interrupting my thought. I'm trying to think about the, the capacity of the, uh, sorry, the capacity of the ark had, had the capacity of 50 Boeing 747s. Uh, I'm sure that you came to Sunday school to learn that this morning, right? <laughs> so, uh, sorry. All right, so you're all right. Okay, so first of all, he was walking with God and he was uh, building the ark and, and, um, and all right. So now, first of all, number one, we found from uh, Hebrews 11:6, in speaking in the context of Noah, that he that come to God must believe that he is and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, n number one, Noah was busy believing that God was, and Noah was busy diligently seeking God. That's how can he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So he was, number one, he was seeking God and believing. Number two, Genesis 6, 9, Noah was a just man. He was a just man. He was keeping himself clean from the filthy world that was around him. That was the second thing he was doing. Genesis 6, 9, it also says that Noah was perfect, or tamim, it means a whole or complete. So he was no number three. Noah was busy keeping himself wholehearted for God. He was busy keeping himself from becoming half-hearted for God, not letting himself slip into a half-hearted routine of just being religious. And then it says in 2 Peter 2 5, Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, it says in 2 Peter 2, 5, a preacher of righteousness. So the earth, by the way, at that time, as we've seen, was a violent place. It was a dangerous place to go into. There's places in Tijuana that you don't want to go into. That's the way the whole earth was. It was vi brutally violent. It was, it was not a safe thing for Noah to go and preach to them. But he was busy preaching. And what was he preaching? Was he preaching, now I lay me down to sleep? No, he didn't, wasn't preaching. He was preaching, the world is corrupt. He was preaching, all flesh has corrupted itself. He was preaching, the end of, of the world is near. The end of all flesh is coming. He was preaching, violence is filling the earth. And he was preaching, God is going to destroy the earth. So that was con uh, what he was preaching. And he was also preaching, and there's an ark, if you believe that. So, <clears throat> Hebrews 11:7 7 says, By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen, moved with fear, and as you said, John, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world. See? So, uh, it's obvious that he was very busy building an ark. He was building an ark. But the strongest sermon that Noah preached, that Noah ever preached, was the sermon he preached with his hammer. Because he said all these things, but when people went 
to see Noah, and they saw him swinging that hammer to build that ark, they realized this man's taking this stuff seriously. That was the strongest sermon he ever preached was when he was preparing the ark. That's why it says in Hebrews 11, 7, that he prepared an ark, and it says, by the which he condemned the world. That was his message in building the ark, that he condemned the world. Now, the other thing that, that he did in, in, in um, number five is, it says, you mentioned Kevin, in Genesis 6, 9, Noah walked with God. He walked with God. So Noah was busy walking with God. He was busy walking with God. During those 120 years when, the, when, when Noah was building the ark, we never read that Noah wavered. We never read that Noah vacillated. We never read that he was double-minded or half-hearted. Why not? Because he was busy walking with God. That's a very interesting phrase, to walk with God. To walk with God does not mean to sprint with God. It's easy to, sometimes it's easy to sprint with God, as long as it's not too far. I mean, there are times in our lives when we feel just on top of the world, which sometimes... You know, we wake up and say, boy, zippity doo dah, zippity a, oh <laughs> my, oh my, what a wonderful day. You know, plenty of sunshine and it's heading my way. So sometimes we feel that way, but just like Jiminy Cricket, right? <laughs> but, but there are times, and, 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 th and that happens, sometimes we wake up and we really feeling, feel like loving the Lord Jesus Christ. That happens. We say, praise the Lord, and we have a burst of energy, a burst of effort, and we sprint for a short time. That's not hard, but that usually doesn't last. But that's why it doesn't say he sprinted with God, or ran with God. But he walked with God. Walking is meaning consistency. That's far more difficult, requires a different frame of mind. A walk does not require a burst of energy, but it requires some conservation of energy. I mean, a walk requires a steady pace. That's the key. Spiritually speaking, that is what we need. You know, when you hike to a destination, hiking, oftentimes you, you, you can't see your final destination, but you've got to keep walking. Our life is like that hike to heaven. And sometimes we don't, we're not going to see the final destination, maybe until just the last trek. When I, think of, when I think of pacing yourself in this walk, you know, I think back to my junior year of high school, 1964. And that summer, my, my father, under the advice of, of the psychologist who felt that the problem with me is I didn't have clean air going into me, sent me to Colorado, <clears throat> to a little town called Carbondale outside of Aspen, Colorado, where a school had started called Colorado Rocky Mountain School, which was patterned after Outward Bound School. And I don't know why they made these places, but anyway. And, and so we trained there for, for the summer, and for 14 weeks, <clears throat> we hiked up different mountains in Colorado. I remember the first mountain that I hiked on, and I was telling them that I couldn't hike down and they had to call a helicopter, my father would pay for it. I told them, and I was explaining to them, this is no place for a Jewish boy from Beverly Hills to be. But we finally, we did get in shape eventually, and we hiked to the top of Mount Castle. That was, that was our great thing, it was 14,250 feet, and saw Robert Kennedy's signature on the top. Well, for a finale of the camp, we divide into two groups, about 75 boys and girls in one group, and 75 in another group. And one group drove in the trucks to the Navajo Indian Reservation in the Glen Canyon Desert. I don't know if you know where this is. I never knew it before. But anyway, it's a place called Rainbow National Park, uh, where there was Indian Reservation. This was the summer. It was very, very hot. And they were to leave their trucks at one point where the road stopped and hike through a canyon desert overnight meet up with the other group that I was a part of in the middle of the canyon desert. And, and our group previously had started out four days earlier rafting up the river. And that, that same, the afternoon of that night, we left our rafts there on the river shore, and, and we started to hike through the canyon desert, see? And we were to meet them halfway, OK? Well, that afternoon, like I say, we pulled our rafts up to the shore of the river and waited for the night to come. It was very hot to start walking. And we were told, don't bring very much with you. Don't weigh yourself down. Don't bring a whole lot of, don't, don't haul a whole lot of water with you or other things because then you're going to meet the trucks and you'll, that's what's doing. Anyway, so we started hiking and it was sand and we'd never hiked in sand before. And, uh, you know, with, with hiking boots on sand, 
oh, we started to get cramps, and it was, we weren't making very much progress, and it was miserable. It was terrible. And our guide was a Swiss man. His name was Fritz, and he had his, <laughs> he had his trusty German shepherd dog called Hanna, and he would be yelling, home to Hanna, home to Hanna. I don't even know what that means, but that's what he did. And so we, we were in this canyon desert, and, it, and all of a sudden, as we were going there, just really having a tough time of it, it was pitch black because it was canyons, see? We were down in the canyons. And it was just pitch black. And, and some of us who had flashlights felt compelled to identify everybody who came along and shine the flashlight in your face, see? So immediately your eyes, you know, go like this. So you're just about blind. You're blind all the time. You can't see anything. And there were paper signs for us telling us where to walk. And I remember we came to one sign, and Fritz looked at the sign, and he really didn't know, you know, where to go. And, and so he made the wrong decision. And we ended up going way off into the left, and we should have gone right, and we were lost. We were lost. And, and when it got to about 11 a.m., it was 140 degrees in this, in this canyon. And we had, and, and we drunk all our water, because we were told, don't bring, don't haul it. So there we were. We walked all day. And, and then it was known that we were lost, and Civil Air Patrol planes were out looking for us, but they couldn't see us, because we were down in the canyon. We saw them. And so, um, so there we were. So uh, then we had to spend the night. That evening was so bad. One girl that was part of our team, she, she fell and went into convulsions. We thought she was going to die. It was just that bad, and thank God she didn't. But at that point, Fritz realized this is a very serious situation. And so before we went to sleep, he, he ordered us to divide into two groups. And the ones that, 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 who didn't try to walk out were just to stay there, and the others were to give them whatever covering they had, and they were to hook up uh, shade tents, shade tents and shield from the sun. And then a smaller group of 12 of us that, who wanted to try, we were to walk out. So I don't want to sit there, so I said, okay, I'll walk out. So, so we, we were trying to get out. And, and so I remember Fritz sitting the 12 of us down before we started and giving us instructions. And he told us that we were not to walk as a group, but that everyone had to choose his own walking pace. Everyone had to choose the pace that he could maintain. He said, we shouldn't try to keep up with somebody or to wait back for somebody else. Just walk alone and concentrate on your pace, and you'll discover, discover what is the right pace for you to get out. And he cautioned us, don't go too fast. Uh, just keep a pace. So I found my pace and started walking, and you know, I found myself alone, and I was walking, and I got to the place where the piece of paper was on the trail, and and realized, okay, that's the wrong, that's the place where we, you know, we all knew where it was. So you know, it started to head, and but the, the the place where it said to head was like right up a mountain. We were in a valley, so you got to go right up a mountain. So I thought, okay, I can make that. So I got up to the top of the mountain. I expected to see the Navajo Indian Reservation's buildings. But I got to the top of the mountain. I was so disappointed. All I saw was another valley and another mountain. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, I think I can do that. So I went down that valley and up that next hill. Same thing happened. No buildings, disappointment, another valley, another hill. Did that four times. Finally, when I reached the fourth hill, I saw the reservation buildings. I was so happy. I didn't even, that last walk was nothing. And later that day, they sent in a, a team of mules, and everyone uh, got out safe. And that night, we all watched Walter Cronkite report uh, that, you know, a group of silly kids was lost and got found. <laughs> That's what it means to walk with God. That's what it means to walk with God. It's a test of endurance. It's not how you start that counts. It's how you finish. And the goal is to make it through and don't collapse along the way. And so choose a pace that's right, not too slow, where we lose the challenge and become idle or, or let ungodly attractions draw us away. And not too fast, where we get exhausted and just give up because we've chosen too great of a goal. You know, don't start off a Christian life and say, well, I'm going to have three hours with the Lord every day. You probably will at the beginning. That'd be great, but you won't maintain it. Maybe start with 20 minutes and build up from there. But we don't let ourselves become discouraged. That's the key. We just we can go from one hilltop to another hilltop and just keep on going because, because one of these days we're going to see heaven. 
Noah was busy walking with God, number five. So let's review them. Five things that Noah was busy doing before the flood. Number one, he was busy believing and seeking God. Number two, he was busy keeping himself unpolluted. Number three, he was busy being wholehearted. Number four, he was busy preaching. And number five, he was busy walking with God. Three things that God was doing before the flood. He was busy looking hard into the hearts of men. If there were any thoughts or imaginations toward repentance. He was busy creating a space for men to repent. He was busy waiting. He was busy being long-suffering. And number three, he was busy talking to Noah about preparing for salvation and persuading men to follow him to be saved. Two things the world was doing before the flood. They were busy becoming violent and making moral corruption a habit of life. And they were busy willfully, number two, becoming willfully ignorant or the new not generation. Now, when we look at verse 12 here and 13 of Genesis 6, it's very, very significant when it says, God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. In verse 13, it said that God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with virus. That's a very, very interesting word. Uh, <clears throat> nothing terribly earth-shattering to reveal in the Hebrew there. It just means end. The end of all flesh is come before me. But the words are very important, the end. Because it really, when it says the end, it's describing the end of a process. It's describing the end of stages in that process. That's what it's describing. I just can't help but look at that and think of cancer and how this really is an, a, a picture of sin, like cancer is a, a picture of skin, sin. You know, as a, as a company, we've worked in the cancer diagnostics for about 30 years. And Dr. Myoga, who you may have seen a few, a few weeks ago, Dr. Kim Yoga, he was our former president before he retired to scan bodies Japan. And he actually was the inventor of the term tumor marker. You probably have all seen the term tumor marker. He invented it. At a meeting in New York in 1982, where cancer, speci cancer specialists from all over the world came, and he was the only industrial representative working at that time for Abbott Laboratories, and he uh, brought up the meeting, why don't we call this tumor marker, and it stuck. Well, uh, anybody know what today's date is? <laughs> today's date is, apart from the first day of Hanukkah, <laughs> today's date is December 9th, okay, in case you didn't know. Well, that's an important date for me, because December 9th is the anniversary date when cancer became personal, for me, because that was the date, December 9th, 2010, two years ago, when I was told at Grossmont Hospital that my biopsy results for the tumor mass along the spine were non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and then they said, and it is stage four. Well, in, in, <clears throat> when you look at the history of sin in the Bible from where we are now, and the progression of cancer, there's similarities. Stage one, is a cancer that is relatively small. It's confined to the organ that it started in. And even though the cells are growing out of control, they still maintain, when you look at them histologically under the microscope, with a level of differentiation that, that you know, lung cells look like, lung cancer cells in stage one look like lung cells. Uh, mammary gland cells in stage one cancer look like mammary gland cells. Pastor Jim had stage one salivary cancer, I think. Anyways, in Genesis 4.8, when Cain killed Abel, relatively speaking, Cain was a minority, and he's still in the minority, and he still talked with God. He had that conversation with God. But spiritually speaking, that was like a stage one cancer as far as the earth is concerned. Then in stage two, cancer is now larger in size. It's not spread to surrounding tissues, except it may be in some, in some uh, lymph glands close to the cancer. So Katie Smith had stage two breast cancer. She had it spread into the lymph in her, under her arm. And <clears throat> in Genesis 4.23, we see Lamech now with a group around him, and they've all come around him, and he's bragging that he is more of a murderer than Cain. That'd be like stage two cancer. In stage three cancer, cancer now is much larger. It's lost much of its differentiation of being like lung cells. They don't look like lung cells anymore, for example. And it has spread extensively into the lymph system, to lymph glands. Ed Halderman had stage three cancer. 
in Genesis 6, 3, where we read that God had been striving with man, <clears throat> where there are now, we, we get the picture, there are now many who have cast off God. So spiritually speaking, the world was at stage three cancer. And at stage four cancer, cancer has now become metastatic. Metastatic meaning that it's now spread to another organ other than where it started. That was my case. It, and I had stage four cancer because it didn't start in my spine, it started in my bone marrow, and it was also in the spleen. And in Genesis 6, 12, when God said all flesh had corrupted his way, and in verse 13, that the end of all flesh has come before me, spiritually speaking, that was like the world was in stage four cancer. Okay, that's as far as we'll go this morning. Next, in our next study, we're going to look at the covenant that God made with Noah, Noah's building the ark, and Noah's coming into the ark. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for being Lord to the world and to us, who the one who we love to call you the God of all grace, the God of all hope, the God of all grace, the God of all mercy, the God that's rich in mercy. Lord, all these terms we love to call you because we know they're true and we're counting on it. Lord, help us to be like Noah, Lord, in, in, in walking with you, in not being polluted by the world, Lord, in, in being wholehearted for God and believing you and seeking you and preaching. Help us to be like this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.